Thank you much, so much for being here at CSIS for this event. I'm Carl Endefirth, and I'm the um, chair, the Wadwani chair for U.S. India Policy Studies uh, here at CSIS. Very delighted that you could all be here uh, for this occasion. Uh, we are honored to have uh, four distinguished speakers here uh, with us um, uh, this morning, uh, beginning with the Minister of Commerce and Industry, uh, Arnand Sharma. We want to welcome him uh, not only to CSIS but to Washington. He has just arrived from New York City. Uh, we're delighted to have you here and he's got a number of very important meetings here over the next two days and we're so pleased that he could be here to share his thoughts with us and he's our keynote speaker and he will be speaking on emerging economies and evolving partnerships. So that will be uh, his remarks. We're honored to have with us again uh, the Ambassador of India to the United States, uh, Mira Shankar. Ambassador, thank you so much for being here. We, we are almost um, feeling like family these days. As many of you know, on June 9th, we had a major event on Capitol Hill uh, with the Senate India Caucus, Senators Warner and Cornyn, and Ambassador Shankar uh, graced us with her presence there, uh, along with Assistant Secretary Robert Blake to talk about our relations. So thank you again. You are uh, certainly um, always so welcome uh, at the events that we have at CSIS. We're delighted to have you here. We also have two additional guests uh, that are here uh, from the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Harsh Marawali, who is the president of FICI. All of you know this important organization, the largest and oldest business organization in India. Uh, we're delighted to have him, as well as uh, having with us Dr. Rajiv Kumar, who is General Secretary of FICI. So we're so pleased to have both of our guests from FICI, and they will be speaking on the subject of U.S.-India cooperation in high technology and innovation, uh, which has been identified uh, as one of the key areas that, uh, that the United States and India wish to pursue. Uh, we have bios for all of our speakers and guests. Uh, I trust that you have picked those up. Uh, we only have until 1 o'clock uh, to hear from them, so I will let their bios speak for themselves. You all know these individuals very well, and rather than taking valuable time to go through their very distinguished CVs, uh, I will ask you to take a look closely at those bios that we have passed out. I'd like to begin with just two very brief comments um, um, that will hopefully uh, place uh, what you will hear from our speakers in some context. Uh, the first one is uh, our Assistant Secretary of State, I just mentioned Robert Blake, uh, has been in India and recently, just this week, he spoke in Kolkata. And he said in his remarks that, and I'm going to read you what Robert Blake had to say, he said, in an age where innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic power are as important as military and political power, uh, America's future will rest on the power of knowledge, ideas, and economy. In this context, we see no better partner than India. I think that partnership which he is referring to is one that certainly uh, Minister Sharma will be discussing in his remarks on partnership. Um, Secretary Blake also said American businesses see in India a vibrant laboratory for research and innovation that will produce tomorrow's goods and services. I think I also read at some point, I think it was uh, former Commerce Secretary Locke who said India now has 45 million entrepreneurs. Um, all of this adds up to a great potential for the U.S.-India relationship to explore our commercial ties and to pursue innovation that will be important for the 21st century. Now, having said this is the, as they say, the proverbial good news, there is some not so good news, um, and that is a piece that I saw in the Indian Express just this week that said that uh, direct foreign investment, FDI, into India declined in the most recent quarter by 9% over the previous year. And according to experts, the government should further streamline FDI policies and make the environment more investment-friendly to attract investments. Um, 
I'm sure that this is something that the minister will be addressing in his remarks. Uh, clearly, we want to see the investment opportunities increase and to see that kind of indicator uh, moving upward. And I think that there are certainly ways that that can be accomplished, and I'm sure that that's going to be discussed by all of our speakers. So we're going to have the following format. We're going to start with uh, Mr. Mariwala uh, to speak uh, for about 10 minutes. And then I'm going to ask Ambassador Shankar to take the podium and make a few remarks and introduce uh, the minister. And then we'll follow uh, at the end of those remarks uh, with uh, Dr. Kumar uh, to end up our speaking portion. And then we're going to turn to your questions and comments uh, immediately after that. So I'm delighted that you're all here. I think we've got a great program, four wonderful speakers, and um, may we start. Honorable Minister, Mr. Anand Sharma, Her Excellency Ambassador, Meera Shankar, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to all of you. I am very happy uh, to be here. Uh, on behalf of FICI, we have, uh, I must say that we have a big partnership with U.S. in the area of high technology group. And we also have partnership with Lockheed Martin and University of Texas at Austin in the area of innovation program, wherein we have trained 240 innovators in entrepreneurial and commercial management. So FIKI has had its relationship with US in this area. And going forward, I believe that if India has to change its course of direction, if India has to maintain its high GDP growth rate, innovation is going to be very, very crucial. Our reliance on traditional technologies and old methods will not do. We will have to reinvent them. Not only technologies, but processes also. And in this respect, we need to look at India as a, pop as a size of the population in terms of its poverty. And we need to innovate more for what we call the bottom of pyramid opportunities. In this area, we have seen many Indian companies taking lead. We've seen companies like Tata's coming out, Tata Nano Car, at $2,000 price point. You've seen the one rupee sachet for shampoos. You've seen telephone calls, mobile calls available for one fourth of a cent. And there are many other innovations in the pipeline in this regard. Tata also are pioneering, or they have pioneered, purification of drinking water, which is available at almost one and a half percent and a half of a cent per liter. And I'm sure there are many other opportunities in this aspect. So going forward, I believe that the bottom of pyramid opportunities are, are very, very high. We also need to innovate in the area of sustainability, social and financial inclusion, mainly for the benefit of our masses. <clears throat> if we have to do this, we need to co-create and cross-fertilize our technologies with those of advanced nations. I am coming from a sector where, uh, in packaged goods manufacture, where PNG Procter & Gamble has adopted a different approach to innovation, what they call the CND approach, connect and develop approach. So instead of developing or doing research in each and everything, what they do is they interact with global organizations through an internet search. And they have developed through this approach many new products. They've also cut down substantially on their R&D manpower costs. And I think they've been far more successful. I think the whole belief is that you can't do everything on your own. And in this interdependent world, it is important for organizations and nations to leverage each other in terms of their capabilities. <clears throat> in this respect, the cooperation is very, very important between US, India and USA. More relevant in specific technologies where US is way ahead of many other nations. I met Senator John Cornyn yesterday, and I must say that his Defense Committee's direction for greater cooperation between India and US producers is a very big step in this direction. 
More importantly, it is President Obama's initiatives on environment, clean energy, and education, which we need to take further. We believe that U.S. economy will be revived much sooner on the back of innovation and pioneering of new technologies. In this aspect, India can also play an important role. We have developed capabilities in science and technology, which can be used to provide detailed engineering and testing inputs. This is already happening in sectors like KPOs and clinical testing of pharmaceutical products. FIKI can play a very important role, a catalytic role, in promoting this and removing impediments in expansion of bilateral relationships. Let me end by saying that we see tremendous opportunities for mutual benefit, and I am sure that this seminar will contribute positively towards this. <clears throat> I now look forward to our Honorable Minister address to give us further leads in this direction. Thank you very much. Honorable Anand Sharma, Commerce and Industry Minister of India, Ambassador Karl Indifurth, Harsh Mariwala, President of FIKI, Rajiv Kumar, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me at the outset thank CSIS and FIKI and Ambassador Indifurth in particular for organizing this interaction, allowing us to share thoughts on the growing India-US trade and economic engagement. I think this has become a key element of the India-US strategic partnership. And as the Indian economy continues to grow, uh, we will have enhanced requirements of both capital and technology where there will be a natural synergy with the United States. Um, as we look ahead, it is not just innovation, which Mr. Mariwala spoke about, but other sectors as well, which will provide enormous opportunities. And I would like to mention two in particular. I think infrastructure, where India will need to invest something like a trillion dollars maybe over the next five years. 2012 will be the next planned period. And the requirement of uh, investment in infrastructure will be huge. Uh, there'll be an enormous business opportunity in the entire infrastructure sector be it in terms of finance, be it in terms of participating in bids, be it in terms of actually investing uh, in uh, particular projects uh, through public-private partnerships. And the Indian government has created a facilitative framework for this through its FDI policies where 100% investment is allowed in most of the infrastructure sectors, including power, roads, ports, and so on. Uh, electricity, where you can invest 100% in generation, transmission, and distribution. So this I would see as one particular opportunity. The other would be manufacturing. Now, I know this is not something which has been a focus of the India-U.S. relationship, where the uh, interaction and the synergies have come from the services sector so far particularly the knowledge-based uh, services sector, such as information technology. That will continue to grow. But where there's a new opportunity which fits in with India's priorities and the need to create uh, more employment within India for those who are not so highly skilled is the manufacturing sector. Um, this sector uh, has seen a turnaround. We've seen growth rates uh, last year of over 8%, and for several months, growth rates have been more than double digits. It continues to be a priority for India. We are setting up uh, several industrial zones. Uh, there's the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, which will be along the Delhi-Mumbai uh, high-speed rail freight corridor, uh, basically building on the advantages of connectivity uh, I think there will be something like uh, nine industrial zones uh, along this corridor in uh, six states, uh, most of which are investment and industry friendly, 
There will be ports and airports for quick connectivity. So it might be of interest to US companies to look at taking a sector you know, for themselves in one of these new industrial townships which are coming up, uh, or zones which are coming up. Some are taking off quicker, some are taking off slower, depending on the state, but some, for instance, in Gujarat have already begun to take off because they had the land already. So uh, this will be a big opportunity, uh, both in the high-tech segment of manufacturing as well as in other segments of manufacturing. And this can also be in sectors which then uh, you know, relate to Indian demands because the market is going to grow. For instance, if infrastructure is going to be a key area, then you know, construction equipment and machinery is going to be something for which there will be heavy demand and boring machines and so on. And it makes sense to produce these in India because they're large, huge, moving them around is not that cost effective. And if you have a growing market for several decades, then production in India makes sense. So these are the two new areas I would like to suggest as opportunities in addition uh, to the innovation sector. Um, it is my pleasure and honor today to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Minister Anand Sharma, who is the Commerce and Industry Minister of India. Uh, India-US trade and investment is robust and growing rapidly. Our two-way trade in goods reached the highest level ever of $48.75 billion in 2010, a 30 percent growth on the previous year. There's also been strong growth in trade and services in a broadly balanced manner. And the full uh, figures which are available for 2008 uh, show that it was $38 billion. These growing economic ties have given weight to our strategic partnership. One of the key leaders, uh, which has been one of the key leaders uh, uh, in developing this partnership. And of course, Minister Sharma has been at the forefront uh, of, of uh, propo uh, proposing uh, and supporting an expansion of our bilateral ties. He has taken personal interest in driving the growth of bilateral commercial linkages and has always focused on cooperative interests. His focus on diversification of economic ties has resulted in exponential growth among private sector stakeholders, including in the fields of innovation and technologies. Uh, one of the measures that Minister Sharma has led in India is simplification of the foreign investment policy. He oversaw consolidation of the FDI policy guidelines into a single document and this has been done in a transparent way in consultation with all stakeholders. It will be periodically updated every six months, again through a process of transparent consultation with all stakeholders. Uh, the other innovation I mentioned are these industrial or manufacturing zones uh, which are being set up across the country uh, with a view to providing a fillip to manufacturing. Um, he has also taken the initiative to uh, crystallize a national policy on manufacturing, uh, which is due to be out shortly, and which we hope will provide added focus uh, to this sector. Uh, as Commerce and Industry Minister, he has been India's leading voice in international trade negotiations. He's put in a strong personal focus in reviving the stalled Doha round, including through convening a ministerial meeting in Delhi. During his leadership in India, uh, during his leadership, India has also advanced the economic partnership with several countries, including through the India-ASEAN Free Trade Agreement and the Comprehensive Economic Partnership and Cooperation Agreements with Korea, Malaysia, and Japan, which were all concluded during his tenure. Um, I know Carl Indefoot mentioned uh, FDI. Well, I think uh, FDI inflows into India have increased quite substantially in recent years, 
though they did fall in 2010. I think in 2008 and 2009, uh, they were over $37 billion, uh, which is a high uh, for India. Um, some of the reduction in 2010 is because both in 2008 and 9, there were very high value purchases, uh, for instance, of Ranbaxy uh, or uh, the very big Vodafone investment, which sometimes can create a distortion in terms of how you see the statistics. But I'm glad to say that in April uh, this year, in 2011, uh, we are seeing uh, FDI inflows increase. Uh, it's in one month we've got uh, over $3 billion, uh, which is the same as what we got in the first quarter, which was a bit low. So it's showing a sign of increase. But clearly, we are conscious of the need to create a facilitative environment because we would like to encourage more foreign direct investment into the Indian economy. And we believe that there is an opportunity and that this economy will provide uh, the economic momentum uh, in uh, a major way in the years ahead. Uh, I'm sure that under Minister Sharma's leadership, we will continue to look for ways to optimize avenues for international trade creation uh, through more such agreements. Uh, we are negotiating one with the EU. Uh, with the US, we have discussions on a bilateral investment treaty, uh, and uh, we would hope that those could be accelerated. Uh, Minister Sharma has also played a sterling role in Indian politics and in managing India's foreign relations having served for many years as Minister of State for External Affairs. In India and in countries of Africa, he is known for his personal commitment to the struggle against apartheid. He's been in the forefront of driving the trade and economic engagement between India and Africa. He's a leader with grassroots political support and has been one of the key voices of the student and youth movement in India having been one of the founders of the National Student Union of India, which is the student wing of the Indian National Congress. We look forward to hearing Minister Sharma's thoughts on the opportunities that India offers as a dynamic emerging economy for evolving a long-term mutually beneficial partnership with the United States. Thank you. Ambassador Carl Indefirth, Ambassador Meera Shankar, <coughs> Mr. Harsh Mariwala, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, members of the CSIS, scholars, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here once again in Washington. My last visit was in September. But that doesn't mean that during the intervening period, we have not remained engaged with our friends and the leadership of this great country. India and the United States are in a relationship which is strategic, which is of special significance, not only to our two countries, but to the entire world. We had a path-breaking visit by President Barack Obama to India in November. And he, in his address, which was very well received and applauded by the Indian Parliament, had said that this relationship will have a defining influence in the 21st century world. I do subscribe to that optimism and confidence. Because the way the 
relationship has evolved, embracing core sectors, the trust, the respect that we have for each other, and also considering that both the countries are pluralistic societies, we have respected diversity, multilingual, multicultural, the different ethnic groups come and live with each other, do not tolerate each other's existence, but happily coexist. That is the difference which our two countries have demonstrated to the rest of the world, which in my view is important given the conflict, the distrust that has enveloped many parts of the world. Today, as we see the global scenario, it is important for us to remain connected with the changes that are taking place, to adapt to them and to respond. Before I make a comprehensive observation on what our two countries can do together to further consolidate the existing relationship, I would like to mention that this period in the history of the world is not different from the periods that we have seen in the last century or before. There are always decades which are defining, which bring about transformations and changes, political as well as economic. And those changes have taken place in Europe, in America, and now in Asia, Africa, and South America. There was a time after the Renaissance when the Western Europe developed and determined the global economic agendas. But in the last century, during and after the Second World War, it was the emergence of the United States of America as the preeminent power. And it's the Europe and America together who wielded tremendous influence in determining changes that were taking place in the world until the last decade of the century that we have left behind. When we saw tectonic changes, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the emergence of new countries which were confident and asserting themselves through their growth and development. So the world has been changing and so is the order. Many of you would recall it was said in the 90s, early 90s, that the world has shifted to become a unipolar world. There were many of us who had a different view. I also belong to that group of people who were clear that the world is complex, the challenges confronting us are overwhelming. When we look at each one of them individually, from poverty to climate change to terrorism, pandemics, <coughs> hunger, unemployment for any country or group of countries to address and resolve single-handedly or together. I don't think that it is possible without a strategic cooperative global partnership. And that would call for a world which is inclusive and democratic and order which is representative, not unipolar, not bipolar, but a multipolar world that is a reality of today. The European Union is a reality. 
there are integrations taking place in other parts of the world, whether in Asia, Africa, South America. The emerging economies and the developing countries, as we are referred to, are also making some contribution in driving the global economic growth. Today, close to 47-48% of the world's population is living in these emerging countries, the BRIC countries. BRIC countries are contributing almost half of the global economic output. And in the coming years, in this decade itself, the emerging seven countries, is besides the BRIC countries, also include Indonesia, Mexico, and Turkey, will overtake the G7 in PPP terms and in less than, a, less than two decades, in real terms. If you look at what has happened between the last two decades, especially after the turn of the century, the emerging con country's contribution has grown up from 16% to 30 percent, and now moving towards 40. Whereas the developed countries, when we look at the production, when we look at the growth, has come down, unfortunately, from 70 percent to 40 percent. So we have to ad relate to these changing dynamics and accordingly create institutional linkages so that we can do more than what perhaps we have been able to do so far. The numbers are always interesting, but in two years from now, the GDP of Europe, America, and Asia will be equal sized, each contributing 25% to the world's GDP, and the rest will come from the remaining countries. And this will keep on changing. As I make this observation, we have to be clear that it is a, what the world is witnessing is a rebalancing of the global economy, and which was required for historical reasons. The overwhelming majority on this planet Earth for centuries was left behind the still developing countries, which we are. We have not reached that stage in our development where we can say that our per capita incomes have reached anywhere near the levels of where the developed countries' per capita incomes were, even in the 20th century, or 19th century, end of 19th century. Many countries are still there where Europe and America were in 1914 or 1940. So there is a huge gap. But still these changes are very important. When we look at production, when we look at consumption, some countries have shared approaches and similar models. Some do not. In India, the consumption and production or the growth model is completely different from that of our big neighbor China, which is driven more by exports it's the largest manufacturer, exporter in the world today, whereas India's vibrant economic growth has been influenced by domestic consumption, by domestic demand. And our share in the global trade is still very low 
considering the fact that we are home to 17 and a half percent of the world's population to have less than two percent or two percent share in the merchandise trade and almost the same in services is not adequate we are growing but we are mindful of the fact that we need to do more but these consumption patterns are also changing take the case of Asia and America again. Asia is home to 45% of the world's population and the consumption had, has been seven trillion dollars. In case of US it's ten trillion dollars as the population share in the world is five percent. That's the gap. But in the next decade for the is going to change dramatically. US will still keep on growing, but it will move to 15 trillion as per the projections in consumption. Whereas Asia will move from seven trillion dollars to 20 trillion dollars. Certainly that will have an impact in the living standards, improving the living standards of the countries which are still grappling with the issues of poverty, of education and health care. But going beyond that, the challenges which I referred to earlier, very briefly, would demand that the leaders, the governments, the policy makers focus their attention in all sincerity to working out on forging partnerships or strengthening existing partnerships to meaningfully and effectively address these very challenges. They are not going to disappear. We have seen the various results at the turn of the century when the Millennium Developmental Goals were spelt out. The progress is weak. The gap is increasing and that will continue to test the leadership of the world. I didn't refer to the subsequent challenges which have surfaced with a vengeance and two of them have resurfaced in less than three years. The financial crisis, unlike the previous one, how devastating it was when you look at the sheer pace at which it spread affecting all continents and countries and then followed the economic crisis. Though in common parlance it's only referred to as the economic crisis but we must not forget that unlike the previous economic crisis which have come with regularity whether the 70s, 80s, the Argentinian crash, the East Asian crash, this one was different because it followed a financial crisis, so it was deeper. And that's why longer lasting. There's no recovery. We have not left it behind. It's still very much there because it's, the recovery is uneven. It's wobbly, as we see what happens in Europe. The demand has not returned to pre-recession levels even in the developed countries. It's a matter of concern. And in many cases, if the growth has returned, moved to the positive territory, it is without the return of jobs. So what this calls for? In our considered view, that's what my Prime Minister has said in the G20 meeting in London, that was in April 2009, that the time is to engage more and to resist the tendency towards protectionism. That has happened in the past and nations and the world as such learned bitter lessons. I hope that those lessons 
are fresh in our minds. Because protectionism is, has always been and shall always be counterproductive. It will deepen the recessions, delay the recoveries, which the world needs. And that's why what Ambassador Meera Shankar was referring to, that some of the steps which we took, those were consciously taken. We were questioned. I was asked by many of my colleagues that are you sure Anand Sharma what you are doing? You are going to sign free trade agreements. This 2009 was not 2011. It was very grim environment. But we did. We moved ahead because we believe that this is the time to dismantle barriers, not to erect new ones. And we shall continue doing that without repeating what we have been able to achieve. We are presently negotiating many more comprehensive economic cooperation agreements, or the FTAs as they are referred to, with a number of countries, with Indonesia, with Canada, with Australia, with New Zealand. We are engaging more, as is reflected in our concluding successfully ambitious agreements with Japan and Korea, Malaysia and others, which Ambassador referred to. To be integral to the process of a dynamic development that is taking place in our extended region, that Asia is moving towards larger economic integration. It had never happened in the past. North America saw through NAFTA the economic integration and the rich dividends. South America has moved in that direction. The countries, the ASEAN countries as they are referred to, that's again a very vibrant region and the economic integration that has taken place. The same is happening in Africa. <coughs> At least seven of the regional economic communities there, some have overlapping membership, are working closely. And there is the Africa Union, which has overarching umbrella for all these wrecks, as they call it, the regional economic communities. Therefore, it has become an imperative that Asia is also part of this global process of regional integrations. Besides these agreements, there's the other stream which is now flowing in the right direction. That's the ASEAN plus six. It's the comprehensive economic partnership of East Asia. And plus six are China, India, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. We know that United States of America has also taken a number of initiatives, including now the much discussed, which when we meet, we do talk. And I'll be asking Ambassador Ron Kirk later about the progress on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So it is good that leadership here is also connecting with the trend and the U.S. has to do it, because the United States of America, respective of whatever changes take place in the world, remains the preeminent economic power and will continue to be there as one of the most influential countries for decades to come, even as other countries rise. This because of the institutions that this country has, its universities, the number of PhDs in mathematics and science who come out, the investment in technologies, investments in innovation. That's what we are also seeking to do. So as partnerships are forged between countries through various agreements, 
There have to be partnerships within the countries, between the government and the industry, which we are very much committed to in India. There has to be partnerships between institutions. That's what India and United States of America should do. Not that we have not taken steps. These priorities stand identified. We have economic dialogue, commercial dialogue, strategic dialogue. We have the Trade Policy Forum, right from space sciences to nuclear sciences, and general science and technology, education. These are identified as the priority sectors of engagement and also agriculture, which is important if we have to ensure that one of the two challenges which has resurfaced, which has never actually went away, that is of food security's interest. I will not go into details of these sectors, but I have just listed them. That what the two governments are doing, we should ensure that more traction is there in each of these sectors. And also in working together in innovation, in the new technologies which are going to come in this decade and the decade to follow. Because technologies do make enormous difference. We have seen what they did the last century. Here in this country, the defense technologies, the defense manufacturing gave a real thrust to industrial capacity building because many of these technologies have dual uses or multiple uses. India was able to move forward because we had built the capacity, had the human resources and the institutions to connect with the new technologies which came. They brought about a transformation in the world. That's the information technology, the communication technologies. And those few years really changed the way we connect with each other between countries and between continents. That at the press of the button, there is a flow of capital, flow of information, knowledge. Nobody would have thought, at least my generation, we would not have thought that we will live to see that day and it is happening so fast and it just keeps on moving forward. But the technologies which can be used for the welfare for the humankind. Manufacturing policy was referred to and what we are keen to do in the manufacturing sector. Yes, it's true that we have been working on a national manufacturing policy for the last one and a half year. And very soon, it will become a reality. This will be the biggest policy initiative which India would have taken after we took the initiative for opening up India's economy, the reforms, and the liberalization when Dr. Manmohan Singh was India's finance minister. And it is he who chaired this meeting on the 9th of this month and this entire process has been transparent, open, democratic. We believe in engaging with all stakeholders so that the policy formulation is inclusive and has broad-based consensus. There cannot be any unanimity on any policy. There will still be many critics who will find two faults or 20 faults. And that should be there. That's part of democracy. That discourse will not change in any country. But through this policy, we aim to increase the share of manufacturing in India's GDP from 16% where it has been stagnating. Not that it has not grown. It is growing. But so is the economy. And we want to take it to minimum 26% in less than 15 years. It is an imperative for India to do so, and we are determined to do it. 
because we're a country of 1.2 billion people with 100 million joining the workforce in the next 10 years, if not less. That's the only area where, besides growth, job opportunities will be created and sustainable employment will be there. So what we propose to do in addition to what Ambassador Meera Shankar referred to as the nine smart cities which are coming up along the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, to have mega manufacturing and investment zones. Not too many, maybe five. But these will be integrated mega greenfield industrial townships where infrastructure would be created. And we hope that these regions will become in the coming decades hubs of innovation, hubs of manufacturing, and also converting India into a workshop of the world. Because we have the human resources and the institutions. When we look at this most important partnership for our two countries between the two largest democracies, we want America, its institutions, its industry, its investors to be our partners in this journey. Also looking at the knowledge sectors of the economy, some of which we refer to, but also biotechnology, nanotechnology, value-added manufacturing, precision engineering. These are the areas we need to look at. But how will we be able to do it? Unless and until we invest more in creating the human resources, in empowering our people, which can only be done through training and skills, through vocational education. Our present capacity is to train in skills, maybe five million annually, and we want to take it to at least 15 million in less than five years. So we are investing in institutions, industry and government are partner. New at the high end, we have new IITs and IIMs, the Indian Institutes of Technology and Management coming up. For the first time in 50 years, we are more than doubling these institutions. They require enormous resources, and we do not have too many. When you look at the IITs and IIMs from seven and eight, now we're going to more than double, but again in the same range, eight and nine. But we are also presently setting up 1,600 more industrial training institutes to be adopted by the industry, 10,000 vocational training centers, 50,000 skills development centers. That is not something which is a dream or on paper. Actually, it is now moving. There's a national skills in initiative. There's a dedicated corporation and corpus that has been created. We are tying up with industries. We are encouraging industry. We are going to double up our, our own government's contribution also to innovation. There have been, has been a regular dialogue between Indian industry and also between us and our global partners. We have brought in many modules of these trainings in industrial clusters, some of which are successful. I propose to discuss all this during my stay, and as I mentioned, that this is a dialogue which continues. Yesterday I had a very purposeful exchange with the leading captains of the U.S. industry. Tomorrow we shall be doing that in Washington. And the dialogue, the interaction, helps in creating a better environment, a better understanding. Before we walked into this hall, we were in the holding room and Carl and Firth was saying as to what the mood in the Congress is and how clear the India caucus is in enhancing the partnership 
and the economic engagement. There cannot be a partnership which is complete without the economic component and a partnership, as we have said, which has enormous potential. Therefore, we need to create better awareness in both of our countries, particularly among the policy makers, so that decisions are taken in the spirit of positivity, keeping in mind the larger objective, which are the correct objectives our leaders and our countries have set for ourselves. Thank you. Uh, Honorable uh, Minister Sharma, uh, Ambassador Indifirth, Ambassador Meera Shankar, President Harsh Mariwala, uh, friends who I recognize a few here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, great privilege to be here at uh, CIS, uh, CSIS for this uh, seminar on innovations and uh, cooperation between our two economies. And um, having uh, t sort of following from the Minister's remarks and also having uh, transited very recently from the academic and think tank world where I was for a number of years uh, to the well-grounded realities of Indian industry where I now, now belong. Uh, I want to actually emphasize that the huge potential that uh, the minister pointed out uh, and the others have referred to uh, between the two countries will be achieved uh, if we emphasize on the practical side of it and if we emphasize on the implementation of what we have you know, what we've agreed to, and, and, and if we actually focus on uh, the, you know, the agents of production and the agents of exchange in the two economies. Uh, and um, uh, I say this also on the basis of the paper that I had written uh, for the Center for New American Security on the eve of uh, President Obama's visit, uh, and which has been published, where I sort of, uh, where I pointed out that uh, India and the U.S. relate at three levels very distinctly. One is the G2G, the other is the B2B, and the third is the civil society to civil society. And these are three quite, kind of almost parallel tracks that go, that go on sometimes with ups and downs in one and, 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 and the sort of steady state in the others, etc. And I now believe quite firmly uh, that the B2B relations, you know, which are there, are actually going to be the driver of this relationship as we go forward, uh, simply because in our two countries, in these two economies, which are primarily entrepreneurial driven, which are private sector driven, the intensification of the ties between the businesses that we have in these two countries uh, will, in a sense, uh, inform, and not just inform, but drive, as it were, uh, the relationship, the political relationship, and even, I say, the civil society relationships. And these relationships, these business B2B relationships, as Harsh pointed out, are going to be based increasingly on the innovative capabilities and the capability for India especially to absorb the innovations which will be generated in the U.S. as it tries to rejuvenate itself, as it tries to you know, sort of uh, go forward in the areas that, that, the, that the President, President Obama has you know, pointed out. And I, and I feel very uh, confident that we in India have the capabilities. We in India have the science and technology capabilities and the entrepreneurial dynamism and capability to not only just absorb these innovations, but to adapt them, uh, use our famous uh, uh, techniques of Jugaad, as, we, as, as, we, as, as, as you would get to know, as when you get to know India, and also to Ad, you know, ad, and, and then to innovate further on them to make it possible for them to be transferred uh, to other countries in Africa and, and South Asia and so on. So I think that's the route uh, that, that, that I would like to emphasize that, uh, you know, that, that we need to go forward on. And here I think uh, it is therefore you know, sort of quite important to, uh, for me to give you some examples of what is happening already in the India-US relationship at the very practical level. One is, for you know, let's say, is the, is the is, 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 is a cooperation that we've got where we've identified more than 2,000 innovators, and out of which 240 have been uh, commercially trained under our Lockheed Martin University of Texas, the University of Texas at Austin program, is cooperation between them and FICI, where we send these 
budding innovators. When you incubate them and then send them for commercial trading uh, to the Lockheed Center, where they come back after four weeks, and now, according to the data monitor, they have created about $80 million worth of value uh, for the Indian GDP from new technologies, from new, uh, you know, from, new, from new innovations. There are similar initiatives that are going on in the field of uh, under the U.S.-India Agricultural Knowledge Initiative, where, again, we need a huge new burst of you know, technologies which, you know, which, will, which will increase yields, which will increase productivity, and will keep up with the demand, which we, as we know that today in India, the demand for agricultural products, only 18% is that for cereals. The rest, 82%, is for the non-cereal demand, which is vegetables, fruits, and et cetera, where the logistics, the air conditioning supply chains, where the, you know, where the, where the supply networks have all to be created. And again, their innovation, as jointly created between Indian and U.S. firms, uh, will, be, will, be, will, be most, uh, will be most important. And I, I don't want to uh, go on uh, here, because I know that you are all waiting for uh, us to, uh, for you the opportunity to ask questions of the minister who is present here. And, uh, and, but just to say that between 1974 and 2011, more than nine, more than ten agreements have been signed between India and the U.S. on the science, technology, and knowledge front alone. And these are there in various stages of exploitation and implementation. And I dare say the time has come for all of us uh, to focus much more sharply and put our energies together on removing the impediments which are preventing the fuller exploitation of these agreements. And as far as I'm concerned, I have transited from the think tank world to the industrial world to try and put my shoulder to this most important task, because I think otherwise we will, uh, we will remain at the level uh, where we don't want to be and will not see enough sufficient progress as we should be doing in these, in, in these two most critical ties, in, in the ties between this, you know, the two most important countries uh, in the new centuries. Uh, thank you very much. Rajiv, thank you very much. Uh, thank all the speakers for their excellent remarks. And I think we've got about 20 minutes left, and I am not going to take the prerogative of the chair to ask questions because I want you to do it. So we'll immediately go to the floor, and we'll start here. If um, we can have um, the mic, we'll come around to you. And if you could identify yourself and your affiliation uh, and who you would like to address the question to, that'd be wonderful. Uh, okay, thank yeah, thank you. Uh, Jim Berger from Washington Trade Daily. Uh, I just have a uh, question for the minister. It's actually related to the last point of Mr. Kumar. Right, Ms. Mr. Minister, are you satisfied with the pace of progress on uh, U.S., India, high technology, trade, uh, the U.S. had promised to make uh, India a strategic partner when it came to high technology trade and reduce the present barriers that, that exist. Um, I guess the, it's a loaded question. Are we, are we moving fast enough? Uh, perhaps I could answer that okay. uh, because it's a matter of detail. Um, uh, you know, uh, I think we've welcomed uh, the um, uh, readjustment of U.S. export uh, control policies or the regulatory framework as they apply to India. I think this was a major step forward uh, which was announced during President Obama's visit. Since then, uh, I think the um, you know, entities list uh, has been reduced. You know, uh, companies like DRDO, the Defense Research and Development Organization and its allied companies, the Indian Space Research Organization and its allied companies, Bharat Dynamics Limited, have been removed from the entities list. This opens up the possibility of more high technology trade. Um, we've also agreed that uh, India will be moved up in terms of how it's categorized under the different export controls. So we were at the bottom along with, I think, countries like Sudan and Djibouti and so on. And now we will be moved up into the friends category, which hopefully should make it easier to process license applications pertaining to India. Uh, we've also agreed to some reciprocal steps uh, on uh, removing uh, U.S. unilateral controls, uh, which are there for crime control or regional stability reasons. And um, uh, we have, the U.S. has agreed to support India's membership uh, of four multilateral uh, export control regimes, including the national uh, uh, the NSG, 
the MTCR, the Australia Group, and the Wassenaar Agreement. So it's a pretty substantial package. Uh, it's in the process of being implemented. Clearly, we'd like it to be implemented fast because this is an area where I think there are natural synergies between the two sides. As you heard from our speakers, you know, technology and innovation will be very important in terms of uh, the ability of our companies to realize uh, the potential uh, for strengthening trade and business ties between the two countries. Uh, Wolf Gross, recently retired from the defense industry, and my question follows uh, as the day, the night, from Ambassador Shankar's just uh, completed comments. Uh, what has not happened to date is uh, the Indian government in particular testing uh, the bona fides of, of the U.S. Uh, relaxation of, of high technology trade. Uh, we have uh, Indian services which are perfectly willing to ask for technology from the U.S. suppliers, the commercial suppliers. And the U.S. commercial suppliers' hands are tied unless the government of India uh, indicates its interest in these technologies on an official level. With that, uh, we can work miracles. And I uh, would ask uh, Minister Sharma to carry this message back to his colleagues in the Ministry of Defense. I've never met a bashful Indian when it comes to business but a lot of them seem to be sitting uh, in South Block. <laughs> See, policy formulation, whether in this sector and in other sectors, which is referred to earlier by Ambassador Khan and Firth also, is a continuous process. And that's what India has seen it and those who have engaged with us are fully aware. It's always incremental. It is progressive and moves forward. For example, in the defense sector, we didn't have the participation of the private sector at all. Now, for the private sector, Indian private sector, it's 100% participation investment in manufacturing defense equipment and technologies is allowed and 26% foreign direct investment. But that does not preclude the foreign companies from entering into a joint venture with the Indian entity. And many of the leading defense manufacturers from this country, from UK and Europe, they are already doing it. They are for some very important partnerships so that more manufacturing can take place in India too. That sharing of technologies which have dual use or multiple industrial uses also. So we are moving in that direction. We had been discussed through a paper with the stakeholders, as you would be aware, as to what more can be done in the defense sector. And those discussions are still on. There have been two brainstorming sessions very recently between five ministers since defense is a strategic and sensitive sector, so the defense establishment has to be there on board. But the meetings have been chaired by finance minister, the defense minister, myself, the home minister, we have been together, and we'll be meeting again. And also when we look at other areas, we are conscious of what the industry has said and what the partners and investors have said. So we are always working to bring about a greater degree of rationalization, clarity, simplification, also definitional clarities on ownership and control, which we have done. But the policies as such will move forward only in one direction, that's ahead. There's no question of a pause or a reversal. As I said, that we believe in a process that is inclusive, and we are doing that. In terms of government, uh, you know, defense um, uh, engagement, 
I mean, I just point out that we never used to buy any equipment from the U.S., but we bought $4 billion worth of equipment from the U.S., uh, including through the foreign military sales route in recent years, and have just placed an order for another $4.1 billion uh, in terms of the C-17. So clearly, as far as India is concerned, the government is willing to test uh, the U.S. government's willingness uh, to share up-to-date technologies with us. Could I ask um, for a couple of innovation questions? Uh, the reason I'm saying that is that Fiki is a leader in this field. Dr. Kumar has written about that. Mr. Marawala has a foundation on innovation. Uh, and Fiki, I think you, I've heard that you're going to add another I to Fiki for innovation. Place that into the title of your organization. So if I could ask for a couple of innovation questions, Alyssa Ayers, please. Um, um, but I, it, it, thanks for the segue. I was interested in hearing, uh, Honorable Minister, where you see the innovation and high-tech piece in the national manufacturing policy that's about to come out. Um, I don't know if, it, if there's something that you can offer in more detail here for this audience. Well, we are discussing. There is uh, innovation is very much reflected in the policy, uh, but there is a national innovation council for the prime minister. We have declared this decade as the decade of innovation. And for the industries, we are setting up sectoral councils, innovation councils, which will then merge with the national initiative. That process is also in an advanced stage. What we are seeking for innovation is a special treatment, special dispensation which has been there in the budget when we look at some tax incentives, weighted deductions. And this particular aspect where revenue comes in, so in principle agreement has been reached, but <clears throat> the revenue <coughs> officials and our secretaries concerned there's a committee of secretaries which is presently meeting. By the time I return to Delhi, I'm sure that the final recommendations would be there because we are keen to put in place this policy <coughs> as early as possible. I'll be happy to do so in July itself. Thank you. Add to that, which is the minister referred to uh, <clears throat> the National Innovation Council, uh, which is headed by Sam, Mr. Sam Petroda. And they're actually, what they're trying to do is to set up what they call uh, our, uh, innovation clusters, whereby they're trying to bring innovative capability within the production clusters that have been identified already. And I think this is something that the industry chambers and some industries are actually sort of, you know, quite, uh, quite actively involved in, in, in identifying them. And this is where I think the U.S. industry, you know, can actually really participate in a very active way in creating, for example, there is a textile or the auto component or the, you know, or, or, or the IT sector, you know, the, where there are clusters of, you know, firms already to bring in the innovative capability, you know, and then try and create a sort of Italian sort of model whereby these uh, units around them upgrade their technology and their global competitiveness through the use of innovative capability which is enshrined then within these clusters. I think that's the big initiative that is starting off of there. And the last thing that I kind of wanted to mention is that, you know, there are these uh, incubating centers which have been established now in every Institute of Indian, Techno Indian Institute of Technologies, you know, through government uh, grants, but also through very active industry participations. For example, the Bombay IIT is a case in point, you know, where, you know, there's a lot of this going on. And there is uh, also, you know, so... Uh, and foreign companies are actually active, actively participating in those. So on the innovation side, and, and finally, the CSIR system, you know, and led by the earlier absolute amazing doctor, you know, Professor Ramesh Mashelkar, had created this whole new system about public-private partnership between the CSIR and the private industry, which has yielded lots of uh, innovative, uh, you know, uh, through, you know uh, ideas and, and lots of innovative, uh, you know, advances uh, in several, several sectors. So, all of that together means that the innovative climate is, you know, and the policy ecosystem is getting more, you know, sort of vibrant in India as we speak. Let me add one more thing to what Raji was saying. I think Fiki has also been invited by the NIC to 
recommend take one or two clusters and prototype certain studies which will make these clusters flourish. So we have two, three options. And the good thing is that uh, they're inviting other associations to partner with them and arrive at what will make these clusters succeed. So currently we have decided to prototype one or two areas where we will work uh, and actually work with those clusters, find out what what can be done over a period of time. It will be more a prototype project and the learnings of that will get uh, rolled out to other sectors. Some simple things you know, are already being done. It's not necessarily innovation, but it's use of technology to improve uh, the environment, for instance. If you have a cluster of leather uh, companies and then you put in a common effluent treatment plant, there may be small scale, but in public-private partnership with government, you upgrade their capacities to treat the discharge which comes out, thereby improving the environment. So you're using technology to uh, improve the capacities, not just of the companies, but of the overall environment and their business practices. Or where you have a chemicals cluster in Wapi and so on. So it has both the purpose of encouraging the development of new ideas and products, but also improving the overall business practices of the companies, particularly where they are in a group and where then it becomes far more economical to upgrade in these areas. Further innovation questions. I'd like to have in the back here uh, this gentleman, and, and I particularly would like to hear about frugal innovation if anyone wants to ask about that. Washington is trying to be frugal. <laughs> this would be a good thing to do. Please. Minister Sharma, Peter Gerritsen, uh, recently returned from the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi. Uh, one of the priority sectors you mentioned was the space sector. And I'm curious if there's anything exciting being contemplated in the space sector that uh, might be beyond the typical government-to-government -government civil space. Because the United States has a very uh, burgeoning entrepreneurial space uh, segment where we're, we're that space sector is looking at a, a great deal of interesting innovations. There's been this interesting NSS Kalam initiative looking at space solar power. Is there anything particularly interesting happening there? Well, the institutions are linked. When we look at the commercial usage of space technology, that's happening here. That's also happening in India. ISRO has uh, a subsidiary. It's called the Antrix, which is tying up with the industry. So industrial usage of also of the technology or the commercial launches that is being done. Space cooperation is one of the priority identified areas which I mentioned to earlier. And surely the details I wouldn't be aware of as to what particular project is in the pipeline. But those can be made available to those who are interested in that. But one thing on innovation, moving away from the space uh, question, is that there are institutional linkages which have been established. IIT Mumbai, Rajiv referred to, I was recently in Bangalore in the CMTI, is a national institute of excellence responsible for having developed many a technologies which have applications in nuclear sector, in space, and also technologies for precision engineering. I saw with my own eyes the technologies which are being developed, is set up new centers on nanotechnology, on manufacturing technology, but the linkages CMTI has with the, one of the recent ones with the Fraunhofer Foundation. And within months, they have moved to set up a green manufacturing center in CMTI Bangalore. They have developed technologies which have precision well beyond one millionth of a millimeter. So these are, what is important, the question which I had asked then, and then talk to the leaders of the industry, is the commercialization of innovation so that it's not restricted, though there are many of the technologies are sensitive, but they have dual uses, so that industry comes in and these technologies are available 
for industrial manufacturing. And the United States, as I had mentioned in my uh, remarks, will be a very important partner for India in innovation and manufacturing technologies. Again, in the back, there's a question here. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, my name is Ahmed Mir. I was a foreign service officer and science counselor in Delhi for five years and uh, similarly worked in Mexico. Uh, it's very interesting the tremendous progress that has been made between uh, India and the U.S. across the board. Uh, and uh, Mr. Shankar has mentioned so many uh, options, even though I'm sort of very sympathetic to the progress that has been done through government channels, as I see from my um, U.S. background, is that innovation is very central to freedom and independence and very central to the importance of young uh, performers. And as you have been talking uh, with regard to clusters and with regard to government programs and so on and CSIR, what one realizes is that there is a very strong component of government and organizational involvement. But as you see in uh, Southern California and in Boston and so on, innovation and what the U.S. really has to offer the world and India is actually very well connected with that is through non-governmental sort of connections. And what I would like to ask uh, the Mr. Shankar is uh, are we doing more with regard to that? Communications, magazines, scholarships and uh, 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 participation because I think that really will grow very rapidly uh, what your goals are. Uh, government engagement, I also spent five years uh, on NAFTA and I go regularly to Mexico and I'll tell you just free trade engagement doesn't result in the progress that we expected of US-Mexico relations. Fortunately, the India relations have been uh, much more successful even without a free trade agreement. Sorry, it didn't want to be long. That's it. No, I think the main innovation partnerships between India and the U.S. are private sector driven. You know, the government basically has a few programs which act as catalysts. But the bulk of it is really from the private sector. Uh, if you take a look at the whole you know, information technology sector. It is entirely driven by private companies. Most of the research and development which is being done in India uh, is being done, much of it, in the private sector on a commercial basis, either by multinational companies themselves who have an R&D center in India, and many of the Fortune 500 companies have R&D centers in India in a range of areas. Um, again, there are institutional linkages because our uh, universities are connected in the sense that there are 100,000 Indian students in the United States today in U.S. universities, many of them working on cutting-edge research. You know, I attended the Science National Foundation, uh, you know, annual award, Sir Waterman Award ceremony last year. And out of the three people who were being given awards, two were of Indian origin. Uh, they were Indian Americans, and they had done excellent work. You know, this is, these are young people who will go forward. Uh, and then you look at the academic community in the U.S., the Indian American academic community, particularly in the sciences, maths, engineering, economics. Uh, and that also becomes an enormous asset and many of these institutions have their own linkages. It's not through government in any way. It is direct. The government has two very small programs. One is, um, uh, you know, the Science and Technology Endowment Fund, where both co countries contribute $15 million for small projects, uh, which will, joint projects, which will be, which will have commercial applications. 
And 40% of the new administrative board for this, which has been set up, uh, is from the private sector. Similarly, we have the um, you know, joint clean energy research center, which is a virtual center with both governments contributing uh, $25 million each over a period of time and the ability to raise another 50 million from the private sector. So these are really catalytic programs. They are not really huge programs. The bulk of the energy and drive towards innovation linkages is coming from the private sector. But within India, I think our, our, our industry uh, needs to focus more on innovation in terms of spending more of their budget on R&D. Uh, it, their uh, private sector spend on R&D in India of Indian companies is still very low. Uh, I think we need to wrap this up. I would like to ask one five-second question and a five-second response. Do you think we'll be able to reach agreement on a bilateral investment treaty this year between our two countries? <laughs> that shall be our endeavor. And we are keen to take it to an early conclusion. Excellent. I want to thank you all for your, your uh, being here with us uh, this, this morning and now into the afternoon. I want to thank Mr. Sharma, uh, thank Mr. Marwala, Mr. Kumar, and Vicky for co-sponsoring this with us. And we look forward